future now show. Brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. Hello, Elizabeth. Fantastic having you with us. You're joining us from Hawaii. You are an evolution biologist and a futurist. And you are going to talk to us about the sun and the light. Yes, well, aloha to everyone in our audience. Uh, and uh, aloha is a wonderful, all-inclusive word of loving our planet, our source of nourishment, each other, respecting each other. It's just a jam-packed with wonderful ethics. <laughs> so every time you say aloha, you are saying a lot more than hi. <laughs> uh, when you first mentioned the, the theme of light and sun, uh, the first thing I thought of was this perfect storm of crises that we have made for ourselves. And uh, the Polynesian navigators who taught me about navigating without a compass in simple hand-built canoes sailing all around the world as they did again a few years ago to prove how it can be done. They spent two years doing it and spreading aloha everywhere they went. Uh, spreading malama aina, taking care of each other and our planet. And uh, when these sailors uh, taught, I asked them, you know, how is it possible to sail such a small canoe in huge storms and all these things that happen? You know, how, how can you survive that? And they talked about all of the ways that they had of making sure it would work. One was always to lash all the parts of the canoe together with vines so that it was always flexible on the waves. And then they had so many ways of learning from nature, not only from the stars, because sometimes they're covered, but by also understanding the currents of the water, the seaweed floating, the fish migrations, the cloud formations, especially because they form over islands. And all of these things they knew how to understand and to navigate. And then they said, when all else fails, stand tall in your canoe until you can see your destination. And this is what I mean by the light at the end of the storm. When you go high, and we can all move our consciousness up high to look at the whole human condition like a map below us, who hasn't had a fun on a beach in Hawaii during a dull lecture? You know you can move your consciousness. <laughs> so when you go up there and you have been feeling as if you're down at the bottom of a dark well, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, you don't know what to do anymore, one thing after another is hitting you climate change and economic disaster and now new warfares. Um, and, and so if you rise above it all and you think in a big picture way, as I do as an evolution biologist, you begin to see the patterns of change of this terrific time of transformation where humanity simply has to move from the immature mode of creative expansion and hostilities, competitions, and ever expanding your economy into the stable, mature economy. Just as we grow, our cells grow, and we, we get bigger all the way up to adolescence, and then somehow we have to stop growing bigger and level off for most of our lives with the uh, trillions of cooperative cells running us, right? So this is what gives me hope. When you rise to the top, when you see that at the end of the storm, there's a golden light and the sweet silver song of a lark as the psalm goes, that we can see that light at any time that we feel we're in the dark by moving above, looking at what have I been doing that isn't working? Where might I move something that would work, that would contribute? Because everyone has something to contribute. And so it's it's really the... the uh, the sun aspect of the light, of course, has a lot to do with global warming in my book <laughs> these days. So shall I move on and talk about that? The global warming, of course, has a great deal to do with the sun because it's the sun that's going to make us hotter, right? But it's the conditions on the planet that make it possible uh, or make it necessary for the sun to be heating us more than we have been. 
And so we should be very, very concerned with our relationship with this sun that has miraculously uh, fed life for 4 billion years. And very early on when there were only microbes on the planet, the solar energy was harnessed by bacteria who figured out how to do photosynthesis, how to take this magnificent light, this heat of the sun, this light of the sun and transform it into food uh, so that, that plants can live on, when, when uh, there was a time in the ancient bacterial world where the microbes in their juvenile mode were causing a lot of problems, you know, because they were competitive and they were eating up all the free food and there was starvation all over the planet. <clears throat> and it was the photosynthesizers who saved the day because they could just use the remaining minerals and the water and that sunlight to create food uh, and to create it not only for themselves, but for all others. And so throughout evolution, plants and animals have been feeding each other, the one making carbon dioxide, the plants taking that in and photosynthesizing and feeding the oxygen back to the animals, including ourselves. So there's the simple story of evolution is that we constantly go through this maturation cycle and that that's exactly where we humans are now. The past 6,000 years of empire building have all been juvenile, expansive economy, conquer your enemies, take them in, you know, manipulate them, exploit them. And now we see, we see so clearly with this war in Ukraine, for example, again, it's a war about oil. It's all about oil. Russia needs to sell the oil in order to make, buy the weapons to make such wars. And if we can just get the lesson here that we must all not do any more fossil fuels, that we must immediately shift to the solar green economy, right? Taking our lessons from the sun and from hydrogen and wind and all these other ways we have to do it. So let's turn our understanding and our love of our planet and its sun that has taken care of it for so long and stop messing up, stop exploiting the ecosystem, wrecking our ecosystems and making war on each other when uh, perhaps the biggest lesson I learned in evolution was it's cheaper to feed your enemies than to kill them. We must stop making weapons. We must take the profits out of war because we are facing climate change. We're all gonna be digging ourselves out of flood, fire, famine, sea level rise, you know, all of these things are happening and we cannot afford to have to spend our time and energy digging people back out of war, you know, wrecking people and then making them come back to life again. This is a crazy waste of energy. In the, in the 60s, the young men of America just ceased to sign up for the military. They would not, they tore up their compulsory draft cards. They said, we will not go to war, make love, not war. And we need to revive that now and get the young men all over the planet, in Russia, wherever they are, right? To say, no more war. This is not where we are. We are here about building a world in the midst of climate change, adapting finding our ways to thrive despite all the challenges we face. So that's my take on light and sun. <laughs> no, we have to, we have to create, uh, you know, the hero, it's interesting during this COVID crisis, we started recognizing caregivers as heroes. This was very new. No longer was it generals and, and, uh, and, and best scientists and stuff, but the people who cared and the people who shared uh, throughout this crisis. And there's much about this crisis that is about the continuation of empire building, the corporatocracy, big pharma wanting to control uh, everything about our food and our medicines. We have now the merger of, of uh, Monsanto into Bayer. And a Bayer, of course, is, is a pharmaceutical company, and so is Monsanto. But now the same company can put toxins on your food supply, Roundup, 
we know these glyphosates are wrecking our immune systems through our food. Yeah. They make huge profits doing this, and then they make a double profit by selling you medicines and vaccines and things when your immune system is failing and you can't cope anymore with the viruses that come along. So we have a disaster on our hands that's huge, more huge than anything in history. And yet we have better connections still. We may not be able to count on the internet forever, but we must build local self-sufficiency, eating healthy food again. Organic food isn't some new experimental thing. It's what I grew up on, what the whole world ate before the end of World <laughs> War II. We didn't Gross. need the word. <laughs> there was no other food. And so we have to, to tell the younger people, this is not something new and experimental that the farm, big pharma is telling you is dangerous. You know, it's grown in cow shit and things like that. That is exactly the way nature wants it to be grown. It's called recycling. And uh, so... Let's let's bring this light into our own consciousness to understand that this is a phase we're going through, like any adolescence that you have to go through as a human. We do it as a species, and we need to get beyond it now and build that world that we all dream of as quickly as possible. Don't allow them to say anymore, well, we have to have oil a little longer because of this and because of that. They think nothing of unemploying all of the small businesses, all of the people and letting them go hang. And then they say, well, but we, you know, we have to be careful. No, there's no, mon no more time to be careful. It's time yeah. now to be, nature is profoundly conservative with things that work well and radically creative with things that don't work. This should not be one or the other that you vote on every four years. Are we going to be radicals or conservatives? It should be a division of labor that is cooperative where some people enjoy protecting what works and others enjoy changing what doesn't work. And they are not enemies, they are friends. That's how the new collaboration will work. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think one thing which gives us a little bit of hope is most of the Big challenges are created by human beings. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's it's our adolescent. And so crisis. we should we should be able to fix it because we did it. Exactly. We Not we are we, we are the responsible ones uh, for these crises, and we are the ones who are wildly creative and can figure out easily. We really know what to do. <laughs> we really know what to do. But we're scared. We get cowed with, oh, now we can't even be six feet closer than six feet apart from each other and all of these things. No, we have to stand up and say, you have to give us healthy immune systems. If you want us to get healthy, then feed us healthy food, you big pharma, you big agriculture, right? We have to, to insist on these things. Mm -hmm. And we can't any longer just say, okay, well, it's all I have to eat and it's cheaper than organic food. And no, if you really shop well, you can eat very well on the same budget you're using now on, and find ways to do it with good, healthy food. So uh, we know what to do and everybody's needed. Everybody has some way they can contribute, whether they are a poet or a politician or a scientist or, uh, a, a spiritual leader or a gardener, you know, everything is needed to build this world. We know what to do. And Rumi says, why do we stay in prison when the door is so wide open? <laughs> okay, I wish you all the best Thank and fantastic so time in the sun of Hawaii. Thank you. That's what's healing. <laughs> Bye.